Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Our scripture today comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. And while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid. As they entered the cloud, a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept, them, kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at the time what they had seen. Pray with me. Gracious God, we are so glad to be here in this place today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, Lord, be yours and not my own. Amen. This is a mountaintop story, and we love mountaintops. Those times in our places in our lives when we feel near to Jesus, when we feel closest to him. Those times where we know without a doubt that we are loved forgiven and redeemed. They remind us that no matter what, God is with us. And it's an incredible feeling and we are happy really to live in those spaces. And I think that's why the mountaintop in this story captures our imagination. There's a tremendous mystery at the heart of the story. There's surprise and all. And Jesus is there transformed in a dazzling light. And he's suddenly accompanied by two of Israel's greats, Moses and Elijah. And soon after, God speaks from a cloud and proclaims that Jesus is his son. And Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John, they have front row seats to it all. They are eyewitnesses despite their struggle to really understand exactly what is happening. And we, the onlookers, centuries later, we're also invited to encounter the wonder of this passage, the wonder of Jesus through this passage. But in truth, the wonder of God in Jesus is not only revealed on the mountaintop. Yes, this is where Jesus' divine nature is made clear. But the fact is, is that Jesus, God incarnate, is also revealed in his teachings and in his actions. 
What comes before and after helps us see the whole story. And I think it's only when we consider the wonder of it all that we fully see who Jesus is. The Son of God who calls and strengthens and sends us into the world. But since this passage does start on the mountaintop, that is where we will begin. Now, there are many stories in Scripture that speak about mountains as holy places where people encounter God. As a matter of fact, both Moses and Elijah play central roles in two of these stories. Moses went up the mountain to meet with God and saw God from the backside. And when he came down, the people said his face was shining like the sun. And then Elijah, he went through the wilderness back to that same mountain, the mountain of God. He went up it, he went into a cave, and it was there that he heard the voice of God telling him that it was okay and that he was going to send him back to the people because Elijah was not alone. These mountain stories, these three included, almost always talk about what happens at the summit. They barely give a nod to the ascent and say very little about the descent from the mountain. And if you've ever hiked, well, it's not hard to imagine why this is so. It is the experience of the summit that we like to tell about. That moment when we stand on the edge of the mountain and we look out over the valleys, it's almost impossible not to be filled with awe and wonder. It's beautiful, and it can have a very profound effect on us. When I was in high school, I spent part of one of my summers in Colorado and was able to hike in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, which means the blood of Christ. This mountain range is part of the Rocky Mountains, and it has peaks that are anywhere from 12,000 to 14,000 feet. And the views from these peaks, from these mountains, they are stunning, and they stay with you long after you are there. Even today, I can remember standing on a ledge overlooking a valley and a high mountain lake, much like the one here in this picture, while it snowed in July. It's a moment that has stayed with me despite the 32 years that separate it from today. Yet when people asked me about being there in those places, and even today when they ask me about it, it's hard for me to put it all into words. And I imagine that is how Peter and James and John felt on that mountain. It's not surprising that Peter wanted to stay on the mountain because reaching that high ground and catching your breath and fully seeing the beauty of it all, that makes you want to stay. And the disciples, once their minds cleared, once they were fully awake, they saw the fullness of God in Jesus. It was profound. It was a mountaintop experience. They were amazed because they were seeing Jesus appear in all of God's glory. And then they heard God speak. But then the text tells us that they kept it to themselves at that time. And why do we think that is? Maybe because they just didn't really fully understand what had happened. They needed to process it. They needed to put it into context. And it's only later that we actually hear them tell about it, after they've seen and experienced much more. We hear Peter write in 1 Peter that we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And John reflects later in one of his letters that we will know Jesus when he appears because he will see, because we will see him as he is. They knew. They knew in part that they had encountered something holy. And we know what that is like. When we have that mountaintop experience, there is always a story that comes before it, and even one that comes after it. That mountaintop experience, it often changes the way we view the preceding events and leads us into new understandings. 
And so like us, the disciples had to consider that mountaintop experience in context of their full experience. The transfiguration of Jesus offered a glimpse of what is possible, not only for Jesus, but for all of humanity. And it's this glimpse that helped complete the story. The encounter at the summit, though, only happens because we're willing to make the climb. If we don't make the climb, we'll never get to the summit. So the encounter with Jesus happens when we choose to follow, when we choose to go where Jesus is going. Now, if you look back before today's passage, you'll see just before it that eight days before, Jesus had told the disciples that he was going to die. And then he had said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. But following Jesus, that's not always easy. In fact, if we think of the mountaintop as a metaphor for encountering Jesus, we can think of the climb as a metaphor for our approach to him. Looking back on my experiences of hiking, I realized that whenever I see the entrance to a trail, it doesn't typically tell me a lot about what is to come. Matter of fact, when you get to the entrance of a trail, usually it looks pretty easy. It might even be kind of pretty, like with an arch, like you see here. But you don't see a lot of incline. It might be a slight slope. But you don't know what is next. It's not until you start walking that you really begin to experience the inclines. And sometimes you'll look up the trail and you'll think that you see a crest but then when you get there, you realize that it's only a turn or that the trail has sloped in such a way that you can't see the rest of it. And then there's those times when you land on some unstable ground and you have a hard time keeping your balance and you slip kind of backwards or maybe even forwards. And soon your pack can begin to feel really heavy and you begin to wonder if you will ever reach the summit. Following Jesus is much like this. Early on in the journey of faith, it seems relatively easy, but it doesn't take long for the twists and turns of life to become more complex and challenging. And soon it can feel like the hardest trip that we ever take. Following Jesus is often defined more by the climb than by the summit. There are times when it may feel like we won't survive and we want to give up. And if you think back to that story I mentioned earlier about Elijah found in 1 Kings, he was in the desert. He was praying to die. And then he went to the mountain and poured out his heart to God. And I suspect if the disciples had fully understood what Jesus was saying those eight days before, it might have been harder for them to make the decision to follow him up the mountain, much less to the cross. Yet it is this journey with its glimpses of grace and glory that ultimately fills them with gratitude and strengthens them. The journey to the top is worth it. The disciples see what others will only see later. And they wanted to stay there, but they learned that we are not meant to stay and the rarefied air. Our personal experiences with God are not always meant to be private. Jesus has changed in a way that he is, is changed in the way that he is seen and acts in and for the world accordingly. And seeing Jesus differently means seeing ourselves differently. It means living our lives that are changed through our encounter. And we can't encounter the kingdom, see the divine, and not be changed by it. The transfiguration, it takes place on the mountain, but the next day, it comes down to the street. The street where the people live and need transfiguration. Listen to the rest of the story from Luke 9. 
The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met them. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. Jesus says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. And even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. When Jesus came down the mountain with Peter, James, and John, they are met by a father, a father with a son, his only child. The boy is losing his life. He's clinging to life. The father brings him to Jesus and Jesus heals him. And then it says he returns him to his father. That day, that father and son, they met the kingdom of God. That day, they found transfiguration. I read this story and I think about the ways that we are called to put our faith into action. We do that often here at RUMC. You can see evidence of it in so many places. And one of those places, it is the giving garden. It's a way that people encounter Jesus at work through those who put in their time there. A few years ago, if you had gone and looked at that plot of land, you might have thought that maybe nothing could grow there. Maybe there was some evidence that once something had grown there, but it was pretty rough looking. But then a member of our congregation, she had an experience, an encounter with Jesus, and she had a vision to plant a garden there. She gathered people to help her as she had shared her heart, and they began to work to plant that garden. And today, that garden, it provides hundreds and hundreds of pounds of fresh produce to families who otherwise could not afford it. The garden doesn't entirely solve the problem of food insecurity in our community, but it provides hope. It provides hope and through it, people are discovering transfiguration in connection with others they are encountering the kingdom of God. Professing our faith is one thing, but living our faith requires greater depth and breadth. The path to encountering Jesus, it's not always easy. And when we do encounter him, it's not the end of the journey. It is on the mountaintop that we encounter Jesus. But it is in the public square that we follow Jesus. We live our lives so that others see him. Our behavior changes. We become one with Jesus and in with his mission in the world. And the power of transfiguration is that it comes down from the mountain. The story is a vision that carries us to ground level and gives us a glimpse of unimagined possibility. Soon it will be Lent. Next week we will observe Ash Wednesday and we will begin that 40-day journey of looking at our own lives, of discovering what we need to take up or let go of in order to prepare our hearts for Easter, for resurrection, for new life. But today it is good for us to be in this place of worship. It is good for us to hear this mountaintop story and to spend some time with it. To know and believe that God came to us in the person of Jesus. But we can't stop there. We can't sit in this moment and not move forward. We can't experience the awe and wonder and not reflect on the path that led us here. We cannot stop. We have to decide if we are willing to take 
the journey. We have to decide if we are willing to follow Jesus. Jesus shows us through his life and his words to consider all the wonder. And these glimpses, they help us to know that we are never alone on the path, even in the most difficult times. And to know that we are strengthened by Jesus for the journey. Because in the words of Fred Craddock, without the journey, the world will never be healed. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image, and what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our, when God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.